User groups with lots to say, interviews and more. No way. Sharing great ideas in the tech community. Fascinating conversations, a plethora of information. Find out for yourself today at Ugtastic.com. Hi, it's Mike with Ugtastic again. I'm here today at day two of SCNA 2013. Right now I'm sitting down with Amitai Schleyer, who sits on the TNF. And as you might know, the TNF is the NetBSD, uh, the board of the... I can't even say it myself, but it's a board of the NetBSD organization, or foundation, TNF. I said that beautifully. So anyway, hi, hi, Amitai. Thank you very much for taking the time to sit down with me. I really appreciate me. it. Uh, so the NetBSD Foundation, that's, that sounds very important. What, what is the NetBSD Foundation? Uh, it's a 501c3 nonprofit, and uh, it's basically, um, if you're familiar with the FreeBSD Foundation, or I'm sure OpenBSD has something mm -hmm. like it, uh, we officially accept donations that are intended to fund development mm -hmm. in the BSD. Uh, and to some extent, we determine the project direction, uh, the, the structure of the organization, because it is an organization, even mm -hmm. though we're all volunteers, uh, and the disbursement of funds where we see that it helps development along. So the NetBSD, that, that's, that's like uh, uh, the Berkeley San Diego Unix, that's the, the th uh, Intel or the i386? Uh, in NetBSD's case, it turns out to be a lot more than that. Okay. Uh, BSD stands for Berkeley Software Distribution or Berkeley Software Development, depending on when in the 90s you're looking at the expansion okay. of the acronym. Uh, and NetBSD was one of the two projects that kind of forked out of the, the death of the original Berkeley. Okay. Uh, the regents of the University of California sometime in the early 90s stopped being able to fund the development that was happening in Berkeley, which had been, uh, to begin with, a, a set of patches on top of AT&T's Unix, mm -hmm. uh, but eventually became its own distribution. And one of the hallmarks of BSD Unix, other than actually being able to be used by humans to some extent, mm -hmm. uh, was that it deliberately targeted portability. Uh, it was deliberately built and distributed from multiple hardware architectures mm -hmm. and th thereby forced to be designed to be able to, to work on multiple hardware architectures. Uh, and NetBSD and FreeBSD are the two major projects that, that forked around that time out of the remains of BSD. And FreeBSD chose what seems like a prescient direction at the time that they should focus on commodity hardware because mostly that's what people have and if you eke out every last bit of performance on a 90 megahertz Pentium, you'll be glad you did. Yeah. Uh, and NetBSD chose that aspect of tradition from Berkeley that let's, let's turn up the knobs to 11 on portability. Mm -hmm. Let's stick with that tradition. Let's make sure we're even more portable. Let's find more ways to share driver code, uh, abstractions that let the drivers be shared. Uh, abstract away endianness and other differences between platforms and just make let that drive the design which is actually why I'm here talking to you today because when I hear about craftsmanship at mm -hmm. this conference the Unix that I think goes best with that is NetBSD. Mm -hmm. I think craftsmen who use Unix and appreciate Unix and appreciate craftsmanship should be very interested in NetBSD. Well, I think there's a lot of people here that don't realize that they're very interested in NetBSD, and and we, we kind of tease each other about that Apple logo, mm -hmm. but I, if I if I'm not mistaken, NetBSD is the kernel, the Darwin kernel is based off of NetBSD, or it's a complicated story. Uh, naturally, well, uh, we love complicated stories. Uh, the the kernel in OS X is kind of a hybrid. Uh, a lot of its history comes from Mach, which was developed at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, Mach is the M-A-C-H. M-A-C-H, good. Kind of like the word Mac, but yeah. totally coincidental. Uh, it, it also turns out that one of the primary developers of Mach wound up being an executive at Apple mm -hmm. later uh, for business merger related reasons. But the kernel is Mach. Uh, there is some, some more to it than that. That's actually not my primary area of work. But where NetBSD got involved with OS X is that in an early version of OS X, I think up through 10.2 or 10.3, uh, most of the user land utilities were from NetBSD. Oh, really? So if you, for instance, if you're running uh, user bin FTP, it's the one that, that was developed in NetBSD and enhanced by Luke Newburn and, and distributed as a, mm -hmm. an auto -conf buildable piece of source. Uh, and a lot of the utilities in OS X were like that. Somewhere after 10.2 or 10.3, it became more of a FreeBSD influence because one of the developers from, one of the founders of FreeBSD, Jordan Hubbard, 
was the director of Unix Technologies or something like that mm -hmm. at Apple. And so they kind of moved in a FreeBSD direction for user land. But the, the kernel is actually a different story and I don't know it very well. Okay, so, uh, you know, how did you come to be involved with the, you said that the kernel really isn't where you're spending your time. Mm -hmm. uh, where, where, where does uh, Amatai or Schmanz, <laughs> it's, it's nickname, uh, the, uh, where does Schmanz spend his time? Uh, what is your focus and, and what do you do with the, the, the foundation? Um, as part of the board, I'm relatively new. I was elected uh, some months ago and just began serving. Um, the roles that I had before that were um, two, basically. Uh, one that I kind of self-nominated myself for, mm -hmm. like you do in a volunteer project. Yeah, Whoever yeah. does the work becomes in charge of it. <laughs> uh, and another that I was selected for a while ago. Uh, the other one, the one that I was selected for, is the, there's a project management committee for package source, which is closely related to NetBSD uh, in terms of history and organization, but isn't an operating system project. Okay. NetBSD is an operating system project. Package source is a package manager. And its distinguishing characteristics that are very compelling to me, and I think possibly to the people in this audience, uh, are that it is cross platform. So any kind of Unix -y system you have, even if it's Windows with services for Unix or, Sig or uh, Sigwin on it, uh, or whether you have root or not, mm -hmm. it is still a system that you can use the same way across all of the heterogeneous Unix -y machines that you have. And so if you're a sysadmin, which at times all of us are, it allows you to get the tools that you need or the services that you need installed in the same way on all the machines you deal with, regardless of what they are or where they came from. So in that respect, it sounds like it's a little bit of, of chef and a little bit of um, uh, homebrew or more apt. Or is, it more like, is it more like apt or is it more like a homebrew kind of thing? It, it, when you're saying that it, it goes and it can work on, on any Unixy based system, mm -hmm. um, does it go and, and grab source and compile them locally? Or? Exactly. Uh, so it's uh, homebrew is like some of what package source does. Okay. Homebrew is, a, I believe, a source based builder of packages mm -hmm. uh, that works on OS X and that's it. Package source is a source based package manager. Uh, it also generates binary packages, which you can then reuse and distribute, mm -hmm. but it's designed to be used with source. And so when you when you go and get your package source tree and say, well, today I want uh, Ruby 1.9.3 installed <laughs> on whatever the heck this system is. Right. Uh, CD package source, Lang, Ruby 1.9.3, make install. And what happens when you do that is that the, the source code for Ruby is fetched, its checksum is verified, it's extracted. Uh, if it has dependencies that have to be built and installed in the same way before it can be built, they're installed. Uh, one of the special things Package Source does is to make sure that the build environment on a user machine is identical to that on a dev machine, mm -hmm. so that the package will be reproducibly buildable. Uh, and then at the end of it, you have you know a custom build with the parameters that you control, but the defaults are pretty good. A Ruby that's in a, a section of your machine that's only for packages from Package Source, you put it in your path, and it does what you want. So does it also like resolve dependencies and things like that? It does. Uh, it goes all the way down. Oh really? Yeah. So yeah, because I when you're talking about Ruby, I think well we do have a variety of, of packages, uh, or Ruby management tools, RVM, which I was actually just this morning mm -hmm. tweeting up that they, they need support. But um, you know, how do you exist in that? Are, are you replacements from that, or do you? That's an excellent question. Uh, I'm not a Rubyist. Uh, I I'm familiar with kind of an equivalent problem with Perl, that mm -hmm. if you want to have different versions of Perl with different, you know, what would be gems in the Perl world installed, uh, you want to be able to get those set up and switch between them and know which right. one you're currently working with. Uh, Perl has ways of doing that. Package source is kind of orthogonal, but can be used for that. Uh, specifically what I mean is that you can, you can take one package source source tree and bootstrap the package source tools and an entire set of packages, mm -hmm. as long as it's in a different location, it's totally independent. And the parameters can be different and the values can be different. Uh, so I've used that in the past to, to get one set of packages that look like this, another set of packages in a slightly different place that look like mm -hmm. that. And you can move a symlink or do some other trick right. when you're using one of the other. 
So, so how did you, you said you kind of volunteered for the work and mm -hmm. you just came to own it. How, how did that come to be? How did you end up even getting into a position to volunteer? So that one, uh, that one is a different piece of work. <laughs> uh, NetBSD's website, unfortunately, I don't think sings the virtues of the operating system and the package manager as well as it should. The virtues are terrific. Mm -hmm. The website is not. So, uh, so I took a hard look a few years ago at why are we having this problem. And some people think it's because developers don't like to write documentation. I don't believe that's true, uh, especially among craftsmen, which most of the NetBSD developers would agree that they are. Uh, I think the problem is one of tools that we built ourselves that get in the way uh, that were built a while ago based on old ideas. I think what all of us would agree now is a reasonable way to do web content in this day and age is something more like a wiki with a simple input format, simple output format. Uh, ideally, you can edit it with VI or Emacs in addition to a browser. Uh, so I found a piece of software that was close to what we needed. We had a bunch of tight requirements to be able to run the software. I'm also a member of the sysadmins for the NetBSD project. So I knew enough about the web problem I knew enough about what the administrators would be happy integrating, uh, and I knew enough about this piece of software that would bridge the gap. And then I needed to make it bridge the gap, which is why I'm also a contributor to IkiWiki, which is an open source, uh, written in Perl content management system. Uh, so I extended IkiWiki so that it met NetBSD's requirements. We stood up an example of it. The admins liked it, some users liked it. We now have wiki.netbsd.org, and someday when I have time, <laughs> that will be how our website is made. Oh, okay. So I just kind of volunteered for that, and now I'm on the web committee, even though I didn't really mean for that to happen. Oh, <laughs> it was a lot of unintended consequences. Yeah, but it's an okay one. Yeah, that it sounds like it's a lot of fun, and um, but you know, even going back further, mm -hmm. why NetBSC? What was what attracted you to NetBSC to begin with? Great question. So I went to high school about 20, 25 miles north up the road from here. And uh, in high school, the, the available nerd tooling that I could get at was Texas Instruments Graphing Calculators. At the time, that's all the programmability that I could get to, <laughs> so I got to it. I had one of everything. I had an 81, an 82, an 85, and a 92, which was uh, two megahertz faster than the CPU in the Mac Plus we had at home. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, it's, so it's just right. like today when you have that, that little uh, iPhone and right. a three-year-old computer. It's, it's like, no, the... Shameful, yeah. <laughs> but so that's what I had, and, uh, and I got into the community around it and was invited to participate in a community project that we were building called TICalc.org. Uh, TI themselves wasn't real forthcoming supporting all the third-party things that were happening, so we wanted to be for ourselves. Uh, and I was invited to be part of that. And they were running on some weird system called Linux one point something. Uh -huh. I don't know, the first thing about it. Right. So I said, how can I even be useful to you guys if what I have is you know, an old Macintosh, Mac 2 CI at the time? Yeah. How can I even learn how this stuff works so that eventually I can be useful to, this, to you guys? And one of the people on the project said, oh, if a Mac 2 CI is what you have, then you should run FBSD. So the two CI that's that's pretty that's pretty ancient. That's mm -hmm. so you dated yourself there. And, yes. Uh, <laughs> but, also, uh, this may be. Dated, <laughs> oh, it's not that high definition. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the the uh, I, I didn't even realize that. I mean, pre i three eighty six that mm -hmm. you know pre Intel processors sure. that you could run uh, Unix on on an old Apple that far. So I mean. The, the support goes back that far. It does. Uh, NetBSD runs on old 68K Macintoshes, on Amigas with a similar chipset. Uh, uh, weird old machines, I don't even know what they are. Mm -hmm. uh, a limited run set of machines called the Shark that had, I think, an ARM-based processor, but mm -hmm. not like the ones we have in our phones. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that was famous for being silent and having no fan. It's also famous for having almost no performance. <laughs> but NetBSD runs on it. Uh, pretty much anything with an MMU is enough, and somebody will port to it if they have an interest. And by the same token, NetBSD has a reputation for prioritizing compatibility with old machines, even when it's impractical uh, and gets in the way. And there is a maintenance cost to people who are doing kernel and system development to having to deal with these older systems, but it's not exorbitant. Uh, and nobody should come away with the impression that we don't also run really well on modern hardware. We do. Mm -hmm. So if, if somebody's looking to, they, they, they're running 
um, you know, they got a Mac and they want to get into maybe learning some of the, this heritage of, of the Mac um, and, and want to run an FBSD. I'm presuming I could run a VM with an FBSD because sure. uh, if it runs anywhere, I'm sure it runs in a VM. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, where would I start to, to, to look for that? Uh, just before I get into the actual answer to your question, uh, on the VM front, NetBSD was part of the early development of the Zen system. Oh, the XCN. Right. Uh, NetBSD was one of the early host systems and one of the early guest systems <laughs> and has excellent support for Zen, both as a DOM0 and a DOMU. Um, in terms of how somebody could, could spin up a machine or a virtual machine, uh, it's a free download, actually. There's, there's ISOs, there's tarballs, however you want to do it. Uh, there are systems that you can get a free shell account on to play around with. Uh, and another way to start that for me is, is what I would probably do first is get to know package source. And you can do that with whatever computer you already have. So I could use package source on my Mac instead you of You can. Uh, I was one of the people involved in porting package source to OS X back mm -hmm. in 2001, 2002. It was one of the first platforms that wasn't NetBSD that we ported package source to. Uh, and so for me personally, when OS X came out, you asked earlier about how there's NetBSD in OS X, I used to have to have two different computers. Right. I would have my Mac that would crash at the slightest provocation <laughs> and would let me at least SSH into my Mac 2CI, and then NetBSD over there that was slow but at least would work right. right. Uh, and when they came out with OS X, it wasn't immediately a happy marriage, but I could see that there's a, there's a possible future here where yeah. I only need one computer and I'll be happy right. about it. Uh, and so for me, that's the real, the real win, is that there's enough Unix in OS X and package source bridges the gap with whatever Apple puts an old version or leaves out. Package source lets you catch up to the exact same versions of things that I would have on my NetBSD system. So, uh, you know, not to be uh, intentionally controversial, but do you recommend people maybe really take a look at package source that are using Homebrew and maybe reconsider homebrew or well I'm speaking from ignorance uh, <laughs> because I haven't used homebrew more than a tiny bit I mean I have a good clone of it just so I can see if they have a recipe that I want to borrow something from mm -hmm. because you know they they're focused on OS 10 so they may right. have something that package source doesn't have yet and wants to have uh, but I haven't actually run it I have used Mac ports once or twice a long time ago I tried think uh, I have checkouts of them as well for the same reason but I actually don't know enough about other systems mm -hmm. because I've been so happy with package source for so long because I can do the same thing on all the machines that I have. So I, I couldn't even make an informed opinion about that. So actually, a question about package source, because I, I alluded to, is it also a little bit like Chef? It sounds like you can also script a system to build. You can. Uh, so there's a, there's a concept of bulk builds, mm -hmm. which obviously we do in the general complete case on auto-build systems see what's broken and what we've changed and to generate binary packages. But a person can also drive their own private bulk build mm -hmm. in whole or in part if they have a specific set of packages they want and wind up at the end with these binaries they can just sub in for the ones that they have. So yes. So, and, uh, so if I wanted to say, oh I have a, a brand new install of, of, of a NetBSD BSD server or maybe even a Linux server mm -hmm. and I want to just say go and put all the, you know, put in MySQL, put in um, Postgres, whatever, mm -hmm. I can use a, one of those bulk build scripts to just go off and, and build my system and then use that exactly. to reproduce across different servers. Exactly, and that, that also includes things like compile time options, like if you, you, you have MySQL and you want to build PHP with support mm -hmm. for it, uh, or you want, you know, you're, you're setting up Dovecot and Postfix for your mail server and you want them to be able to store a gray listing database in MySQL or in Postgres. Uh, it's a compile time option, you define that in a configuration file, and uh, the package build finds it, so the bulk build also finds it. And what you wind up with at the end includes the choices that you make. And, and with doing things like, um, like if I, if I script a build for a new server, I'll have something that goes and, goes and fetches the dependencies, builds the, 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 the piece, and then a separate, or builds the thing, and then um, maybe a separate shell script that I call after to maybe do some post-install mm -hmm. configuration. Mm -hmm. Can you hook into any of that stuff with package? Uh, I'm sure you can. Uh, in fact, I went to Package Source Con in Berlin in March, and uh, one of the best talks I saw there was about Ansible, which is one of those okay. remote system and driving systems. Uh, and this is a person who's been a Package Source developer. I'm sure, like, 
I know Ansible is a system of shell scripts, so you can easily hook in a call to package add and God knows what else. Uh, I imagine Chef and Puppet and those guys could do the same. Well, and it's very interesting because uh, when you mentioned Ansible, Ansible is one of those things that I've seen on the periphery, mm -hmm. but never was like, oh, that's just something that somebody's out there. But then when you talk about this heritage, shared heritage now that it has this relationship with package source, it's now much more compelling for me to go and spend time. It's not, a, it's not an official relationship, but it yeah. seems like it's a natural fit. Oh, okay. Yeah. So Ansible is a thing to check out if you're also looking at package source. Um, if if um, so now I just I just messed myself up now because I lost my flow because I took a <laughs> took a took that aside to to point at the camera. Um, so you're here at SCNA and you, and you're interested in in the craftsmanship uh, conversation and you said that it, it seems like a natural fit for what the core of NetBSD is. Mm -hmm. But if somebody's here at SCNA and they're 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 looking at uh, how I can contribute back to open source. Um, is 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 an FBSD something you might point them at, saying, "Go go look at bugs," or where where do they go to look to? I would absolutely recommend that BSD. Uh, I think it represents uh, if if what people here are interested in is operating system development, mm -hmm. uh, NetBSD presents a unique value proposition compared to any other open source system they could volunteer for. Uh, specifically, first of all, as a craftsman, you want to have whatever you're building on to have been made in a craftsman-like manner, which I think one of our speakers yesterday uh, alluded to, that you, you want the tool that you were given to be made with quality, and then you want to use it to pay it forward to build something else with quality. Mm -hmm. NetBSD, for whatever you might want to build on top of it, uh, is a very simply designed, coherent, uh, no funny surprises piece of software, which for an operating system is a serious achievement. Right. Uh, and then, as a craftsman in the world of business, you want to have the option to extend software without necessarily having to publish the changes that you make. Mm -hmm. And NetBSD license-wise, like any of the BSDs, is superior to Linux in that regard. You have the option of making changes that you can keep private for as long as you want to. Um, What's the BSD license? The BSD yeah. license. Uh, as long as you give attribution, do as you wish. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, what NetBSD does that differentiates it from the other BSDs is that by default, every build is a cross-build. The, the tool chain that builds the system first bootstraps a tool chain from whatever your host system is to whatever the target system you want to build for is. And obviously for NetBSD, we built that because we needed it. We have so many target systems. Right. But it means that you can use whatever your fastest computer is to develop for whatever system you're targeting, even if it's an embedded device that's a totally different architecture. And that's baked into how the system gets built all the time by everybody. Mm -hmm. Uh, of course, it's auto-built like everybody does nowadays. Uh, and the other thing that's very unique about NetBSD is, that appeals to craftsmen here, is the culture of testing mm -hmm. that normally you can't do in a kernel. But NetBSD has some very special technology in the kernel. Uh, specifically, it's, it's, as a group, it's called any kernel. The idea is you should be able to take any component of the kernel and target it either for direct linking into a monolithic kernel like we're all familiar with, mm -hmm. or uh, compiling it into a thin layer on top of some other system, or into a standalone program that has all the source code in it. So the, the canonical example for that is, say somebody gives you a USB key, and you don't totally trust them, you don't totally know what it is. Mm -hmm. If you attach that to your computer, it's going to run the kernel file system code to mount and read from. And if there's you know, an attack in the format of the file system, that's going to bite you. So what if you could take that file system code and put it in a user land program that didn't run with privileges, mm -hmm. and, you know, if there's a bug, it segfaults and your computer keeps running. So this is one of the applications of the technology. The reason it applies to Craftsman is that it means you can write automated tests for kernel code that when they break doesn't mean your system crashed. It just means your process crashed, and your test harness can keep running, and it can record the failure. Mm -hmm. You can get fast feedback, and you can go again. So, so it's not only security; it's also testability. And it sounds like it's a recognition that those two go hand in hand as well. A lot of these. Uh, somebody also said yesterday that these design principles sort of go hand in hand. You get, I think it was uh, uh, Halloway, when you design for simplicity, the power kind of falls out. Mm -hmm. So when you design for the orthogonality of taking the same piece of kernel code and being able to build it for any of these target environments, 
all of a sudden you have all these options of how to exercise it. Yeah. Well, uh, Schwanz, thank you very much for taking the time to sit down here. Really appreciate it. And, uh, thank you. And the NetBSD Foundation is something you should check out. What was the uh, URL? Uh, www.netbsd.org. NetBSD.org. Thank you very much. Thank you. User groups with lots to say, interviews and more. No way. Sharing great ideas in the tech community. Fascinating conversations, a plethora of information. Find out for yourself today at ugtastic.com.